Hey everyone, welcome to Electricity and Magnetism. We're going to start with chapter 21 here and look at some of the weird effects we can get with this idea of electricity, like this rubbing a balloon on a cat. So let's go with this scenario. One twin will stand up and rub his feet on the floor, acquiring some charge. The other twin will be standing there and the first twin will shock them. Both twins now rub their feet on the floor and try to go back and shock each other again. The question is, will the new shock be bigger, smaller, or the same? Take some time and think about it and we'll answer that question by the end of the video. So what we got out of the sticky tape lab was that there are these things called charges in the world. Positive and negative charges and they interact with each other in attraction or repulsion depending on what setup you have. So let's look at this scenario. If we wanted to clean the air, I mean eliminate all the dust particles that are in the air. First, what is dust? Dust is just skin cells that you shed off pretty much every single day. So dust is really just small particles of you. And if we wanted to clean them, one thing we could do is let gravity do it. But there's a problem with gravity. Since the dust particles are so small, the force of gravity is very small, and since the dust particles are falling in air, just like a piece of paper, it's going to take a long time to bring that dust to the ground if gravity is the only thing to clean it. Come into a room many, many years later after no one's been in it, and you'll see dust on everything. Gravity finally won. You could also use air cleaners. So there are air cleaners that you can buy. The problem with that is those vacuum air cleaners suck air in one way and push it through a filter, trapping all the dust, and the filters eventually plug up. So you have to buy new filters, and it's rather annoying. So there's got to be another way. There's got to be another force in nature that we could use to eliminate dust. What we can do is use electric charge. Like we saw in the demonstrations in class, there are two types of charges in the world. There's positive charges and negative charges. Two negative charges will repel each other, so you can make two dust particles negative, or you can make two dust particles positive. They would also repel each other. Or you could have one dust particle being positive and something else being negative, and those two would attract because opposite charges attract. So I could charge all the dust negative in the air and have some positive plate that all that charge could be attracted to. And then I could just wipe the plate clean and I'd be good to go. So if your furnace is running in your house and you hear a bunch of snaps and ticks, you actually have an electric air cleaner. The furnace is charging the dust particles that come through and zapping them and attracting them to a positively charged plate that you can just take out and clean anytime. So the positive and negative, where do the positive and negative charges come from? Well, they come from what we call the atom's affinity for holding on or giving up electrons. So some things really, really like to hold on to their electrons, and some materials like to lose electrons very easily. If you look at this triboelectric series here, you can see that things like glass and wool, when they are charged through rubbing the two surfaces together, one object will become positive and one has a tendency to become negative. So when you rub glass on wool, you will actually strip the electrons off the glass and make the wool negative and leaving the glass positive. But if you look at the Teflon, like the PVC pipes we used in class, you rub those with the wool, the Teflon will gain electrons, become more negative, leaving the wool positive. So it all depends on how the materials are made, which is why we need a very brief atomic background for this section. So the first thing we want to talk about is that charge is measured in something called coulombs. It's an intrinsic property of matter, meaning I didn't just make things positive or negative because I wanted to. Positive and negative charges were always there around in nature. We found them and now we use them based on our observations. And where does those charges come from? Well, they come because all materials are made of atoms. An atom has a positively charged nucleus with a proton, it has a negatively charged electron that flies around it, and it has neutral neutrons that really just add weight to the atom and don't have any charge. 
Charge is quantized, meaning there's a specific amount of charge, and the fundamental amount of charge is about 1.6 to the negative 19th coulombs. So it's a very, very small amount, but there is a specific quantized amount of charge for every proton electron out there. And if I want to know the total charge on something, well, neutral atoms have equal protons and equal electrons. So if they have five protons, they usually have five electrons and cancel themselves out. But when we're talking about ions, ions are charged atoms, and ions are either positive or negative, meaning you've gained or lost electrons. So the Q is how we're going to measure our charge. So Q will represent charge. If I want to know the total charge on something, I need to know how many electrons I have moved or... So I take the number of electrons times the electron charge, which is 1.6 to the negative 19th, and that can tell me the exact amount of coulombs of charge that I do have. So here's my very crude drawing of an atom. I've got in the middle, I've got six protons and six neutrons, which actually, if anyone remembers chemistry, gives me carbon. Carbon, the atomic number is six, so I know that means how many protons it has. The at atomic mass is the protons plus the electrons, in this case, around 12, and I know that's not exact. But right now I can tell you that my carbon atom here is neutral. And why do I know my carbon atom is neutral? because I have six protons in the middle surrounded by six electrons in the electron cloud. And no, they don't orbit like planets. They orbit in probability spaces. But again, this is a very, very crude model. So how do I make the carbon atom negative? Well, I would take that carbon atom and rub it against wool or something that has a tendency to become positive. Because if it becomes positive, it's going to give its electrons to the carbon atom. And if it gains some electrons here, all I've done is change my electron number. So now I have nine electrons and six protons gives me a total net charge of negative three. My atom is charged negative three. Okay, well, that's easy to make something negative. How do we make something positive? The quick thing that people want to say is, well, just add protons. So you start adding positives to the middle. But here's the fundamental problem with that. As soon as I start adding protons to the nucleus, that changes the atomic number from 6 to 8. And if you look at that periodic table, 8 on the periodic table is oxygen. So now I have just made an oxygen atom out of a carbon atom. And that is very hard to do. So when we charged glass, and we said the glass became positive, it didn't change the atoms that it had. So to keep this a carbon atom, I've got to have the six protons still in the middle. To make it positive, the easiest thing to do is to knock off electrons out of the electron cloud. So if I start wiping out electrons here, it looks like I'm down to four electrons and six protons. I've got a plus two charge. So that's how, basically, you can make charges positive and negative. It's just the transfer of electrons, not the protons. So there's about three methods of charging that we've done in the lab. We can charge by friction, which is very simply rubbing two surfaces together. Once we've acquired that charge, the easiest thing to do is then touch another object and transfer that charge from one to the other. So in the example here, we've got his foot rubbing on the carpet, and you can see he's charging through friction and gaining electrons. So he's becoming negatively charged. Electrons don't like each other, so they are repelling themselves to the outside of his body because that's the furthest point they can get. And if he wants to get rid of that charge, he can just bring it down and transfer it to the door through contact. So those are the simplest methods of charging, friction and contact, which is exactly the reason we had all those gas station fires due to the static charging of you sliding out of your seat and touching the nozzle. So I'll leave a couple videos here for you to watch of that static charge and transferring from char or friction and contact. There is a method though that involves no contact and that's charging by induction. So we did a couple examples of charging by induction today in the lab as well. So we bring a charge source next to two spheres that are neutral. So in this case we have a positive stick and 
two neutral spheres, the electrons will migrate towards the stick, leaving protons on the one side. Separating the two spheres will keep those charges separate, and then pulling that charge away will leave a negative sphere and a positive sphere. We did the same thing with the empty pop can, where you had a charge rod and the charges separated through induction to separate them. We can also do induction by grounding. We're going to have a positive charge and, again, neutral sphere. You can see how the charges have shifted. And if you bring a finger or a wire to the other side of that sphere, those positive charges can get further away from the stick by going through the ground which again is weird to say because positive charges are the protons and they cannot move. So really electrons come from the ground up to meet it. But when you remove the grounding wire, you can see we now have a negatively charged sphere. We've induced the charges to separate without having to physically touch. So here are a couple examples of grounding, the lightning rods that are on roofs or the grounding wire that's in your house if anything shorts. That wire is attached to a line that goes straight into the ground so all the charges can leak there. All right, so what happens in a storm? In a storm, uh, atoms will collide with each other. They'll charge through friction, and the charges will start to separate. Drafts will bring negative charges to the top of the cloud and positive charges to the bottom of the cloud. And so the clouds get charged just like rubbing your feet on the carpet. And most of the time, the charges will neutralize themselves by cloud to cloud lightning. But if they don't, what they'll do is, you can see the bottom of the cloud here is mainly positively charged. That means all the charges in the earth, all the negatives will rise up and be induced to come and meet the cloud. And if the cloud to cloud lightning doesn't work, we can neutralize ourselves through ground to cloud or cloud to ground. So lightning can jump either way, it really doesn't care which way the electrons move. We talked today about the lightning rods actually being deterrents. When you pile all those charges up on that tiny tip of the lightning rod, it'll leak electrons into the atmosphere to try and neutralize the cloud. But if that doesn't work, the lightning rod is the highest point and we attach a grounding wire so that the charges can leak down into the earth. So the earth becomes induced just by a charged cloud coming over top of it. The one temporary method of charging is known as polarization. So polarization is when charges shift due to the presence of other charges, like sticking the balloon on the wall or trying to pick up. So what this scenario is showing us here is that I've got a neutral balloon and a neutral sweater. If I charge the balloon through friction, I stole electrons off of the sweater. So the sweater is now positively charged and the balloon is negatively charged. Releasing them, you can see electrostatic attraction of opposite charges. But what I'm interested in now is the wall. If I bring these charges next to the wall, you can see that the atoms are shifting. The protons are staying where they are. They can't move because they are the nucleus, but the electrons are allowed to shift. And when you shift those electrons temporarily out of the way, this negative and positive attraction is enough to hold the balloon to the wall. So that's a temporary shift, not a permanent shift. As soon as the balloon leaves, charges go right back to normal. So it's like induction, but induction is a way of permanently charging versus polarization being a temporary charge. Which brings us to the last topic here of conductors versus insulators and the main difference of those. Conductors are made of things that allow charges to move freely, allow electrons to freely go from one atom to the next. And insulators, they basically hold on to their charges. They don't allow them to move. So like glass and plastic, those are good insulators, while metals and humans make good conductors. So here's my analogy for what a conductor is. A conductor is an atom that has openings in its valence shell valence shell being its outermost shell of electrons. So if an electron walked in to a movie theater and you could see that there are three electrons in the valence shell and the electron wanted to move into this seat, it could ask this electron to move and it would say, sure, I can go to that empty seat and this one could move and go to that empty seat. So there are openings and holes available in the valence shell that allow charges to move freely. This is a good conductor. So what would an insulator look like? Here's the analogy for an insulator. 
It ends letters when another electron comes into the theater, but the theater is packed. There's no opening seats in the valence shell. There's no way that those charges can move from one place to the other. So that electron just kind of has to sit there and can't move. So when I put charges onto the Teflon stick or the glass stick or a balloon, they stay put. They can't move because all the outer electron shells are filled. So it brings us back to the class response question from the beginning. Having the two twins, one shocks the other twin, and then both twins rub their feet and come together. So when they're both charged and they come together, the shock should be smaller because now both are negatively charged. So when the charges do eventually jump, the repulsion will make that shock a little bit smaller than it was the first time.